Good evening. How's everyone doing? Uh, my name is Jordan Camp. I'm delighted to welcome you here for the launch of the Russian Revolution, a view from the third world, uh, posthumously uh, published, obviously, and edited by uh, Robin D.G. Kelly and Jesse Benjamin. Robin's here tonight. Unfortunately, <laughs> Jesse uh, couldn't uh, make it. And it's with a forward from Vijay Prashad. They'll be fully uh, introduced appropriately in a moment. But I just want to say a, a few words before. I'm a part of a collaborative research project with Christina Heatherton and with Manu Karuka. Our collective work is grounded in a commitment to anti-racism, to historical materialism, radical feminism, and anti-imperialism. And we link our intellectual work to ongoing histories of freedom struggles. So we're therefore particularly honored to organize uh, or co-organize this evening's launch with Verso, and particularly Ben Maybe, where is he? Uh, who we need to thank for his uh, labors. And also uh, to our friend, uh, Andy Zhao, who uh, championed uh, the book. It would be difficult to overstate what a joy it is to uh, do this event with Robin and Vijay who are both organic intellectuals like Walter Rodney, and they generate radical communities everywhere they go. In my estimation, they stand out as two of the most dynamic public intellectuals of their generation, and I know I speak for many when I say their work has inspired us to do the work we want to do. So thank you both very much for uh, joining us. Um, before I turn it over to Manu, I just want uh, another moment to situate Walter Rodney, a Guyanese intellectual Marxist historian, political theorist, activist, and freedom fighter. Rodney earned his PhD from the School of African and Oriental Studies in London. He was the author of A History of the Upper Guinea Coast, A History of the Guyanese Working People, The Groundings with My Brothers, and How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Rodney took up his first teaching appointment in the history department at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania in 1966. After teaching there for two years, he accepted a position at the University of the West Indies in January 1968 and quickly became a very popular lecturer against the resurgence of mass struggle. He was dearly loved by the masses of people around the world for his distinct ability to communicate the principles of historical materialism in a language that resonated with working people. Many of his students, the unemployed residents of Kingston and Rastas who attended his now famous public lectures, increasingly saw them as his spokesperson. His growing popularity, however, led the Jamaican state to bar him from re-entering the country after attending a historic Black Writers Conference in Montreal in October of 1968. So widely beloved was Rodney, poor and working people throughout the country rebelled against this ban in what were called the, the Rodney riots. And these uprisings were violently suppressed by the state. Rodney then returned to Tanzania, where he was able, as he put it in this book, to teach and develop scientific socialist ideas. These lectures on the Russian Revolution were delivered in 1970 and 1971 and represented a decisive moment in the history of third world Marxism. After all, Dar es Salaam was an epicenter of national liberation movements at the time, and a number of exi exiled freedom fighters from southern Africa found refuge there, as well as radical political economists such as Giovanni Arrighi, Emmanuel Wallerstein, John Saul, and others. The African liberation movements created or embraced the language of socialism and were immersed in debates about historical materialism, the critique of political economy, and the building of a socialist state in the wake of the victories in China, Kerala, Cuba, and Vietnam. It was in this precise historical conjuncture that Rodney delivered the lectures on the Bolshevik Revolution. He saw that the first task of the revolutionary intellectual as confronting the conceits embedded in bourgeois knowledge. It was not enough in Rodney's estimation to dismiss their analysis of the events of 1917, but rather to engage in a political and ideological struggle to demonstrate the power of historical materialism as a method. And it's worth noting 
how much time Rodney spends in this book discussing the very site of knowledge production and the hegemony of what he calls the bourgeois view. He knows the difficulty of historical materialist positions come, out, come about due to a number of powerful forces at work, including direct action to remove those who step out of line, but also perhaps most insidiously through university appointments, tenure reviews, promotions, et cetera. And this was something he understood from his own experience. Um, it was grounded, of course, with the repression, a point that the editors explain in the extensive and illuminating footnotes that not only complete the unfinished references in the book, but situate the interventions in the broader historiography of decolonization and socialism in the third world. In 1974, Rodney moved to take up a position in the history department at the University of Guyana, only to have the position withdrawn due to the country's uh, ruling elite. Rodney was ultimately assassinated in 1980 at the age of 38 as he attempted to build a multiracial and socialist working people's alliance in Guyana. It is therefore even more remarkable that we have this posthumous publication given the history and ongoing repression of the left. For this, we owe a special debt to Robin D.G. Kelly, Vijay Prashad, and Jesse Benjamin. And bringing this publication into the world in the wake of the 100th anniversary of the October Revolution, the 50th anniversary of the events of 1968, and amidst the rise of neo-fascism around the world, they have reminded us of the importance of this history in the present moment. It teaches us about the ongoing relevance of Rodney's analysis of the Russian Revolution, and as he put it, as a very positive historical experience from which we ourselves can derive a great deal as we move to confront similar problems. So thank you very much, and without further ado, let me turn it over to my colleague, Manu, who will do the introductions. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna try to keep it really brief. <clears throat> so uh, Robin Kelly is distinguished professor in Gary B. Nash, endowed chair in history, at the University of California, Los Angeles. He's the author of 14 books, which include Hammer and Ho, Race Rebels, Freedom Dreams, Africa Speaks, America Answers, as well as Imagining Home, Class, Culture, and the African Diaspora, which is from Verso. Uh, his many essays have appeared both in academic journals and in the pages of the Boston Review, The Nation, The New York Times, and The New Labor Forum. And his current large book project is the Education of Ms. Grace Housel, An Intimate History of the American Century. Vijay Prashad is the Executive Director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, which you can find at the tri tricontinental.org, and Chief Editor of Leftward Books, that's word with an O, um, author of 25 books, including The Karma Brown Folk, The Darker Nations, No Free Left, Red Star Over the Third World, and The Poor Nations, which is also from Verso. He regularly reports from South Asia, the Middle East, Af uh, Africa, Latin America, and North America for Frontline, The Hindu, Alternate, Birgun, and NewsClick. So I want to uh, just read a couple quotes that I pulled from the foreword and the introduction that, that they both wrote. So this is from Vijay's foreword. Uh, One has to live with a revolution to get its full impact, Rodney said in 1975. But the next best thing is to go there and see a people actually attempting to grapple with real problems of development. Rodney made this comment on April 30th, the precise day that the Vietnamese people watched the US imperialists retreat from their country. Another revolution in a different form had triumphed. Marxism for Rodney was a revolutionary ideology that required close attention to the facts on the ground in order to search for the revolutionary energy that made itself manifest in various ways. Here Rodney echoed Lenin, who wrote that the living soul of Marxism is the concrete analysis of concrete conditions. And from the introduction written by Robin Kelly and Jesse, Jesse Benjamin. Rodney's perspective was shaped profoundly by his location in an African country that was attempting to build something that resembled socialism in an era when the one-party state was regarded as a vehicle for national economic and social development. Rod Rodney was uniquely allergic to sectarian politics. Understanding the Russian Revolution and its consequences required deep study and reflection, 
if it was to provide useful lessons for the third world. So I'll now turn it over to uh, my colleague and comrade, Christina Heatherton, uh, the author of the forthcoming uh, Class Struggle and the Color Line, uh, due out on University of California Press, and a co-editor with Jordan Camp of Police and the Planet, also from Verso Press. Thank you. but you can hear me. I'm delighted to be here tonight. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm really, I think this is working now. Thank you. Hello, hello. There you go. All right. Can, you can all hear me? And I can hear you, which is a dangerous thing. Uh, okay, so I'm delighted to be here tonight with uh, my colleagues and comrades, Manu and Jordan, and I am so excited to be sitting at this table with, I would say, two of the most dangerous sparks in this volatile but very hopeful moment of ours. Um, so since we're a little delayed, I'm just gonna get to it. I would like to invite you both, Vijay and Robin, to talk a little bit about how you came to the project and reflect a little bit on why Walter Rodney's reflections on the Russian Revolution is an important text for our current moment. Would you like to start? Me? Yes. Okay. Good evening, friends. Uh, great to be here. Uh, thanks, Christina. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to just say a few personal things about uh, what this means to me and how much this book has meant for me, and then I'll answer your question. The first is I'm very happy that the book is being released uh, with uh, one of my close friends, Shanti Singham, in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, her father, Archie Singham, A.W. Singham, was one of Rodney's teachers at UWI Mona in Jamaica. So it's really important uh, for me personally to have Shanti here. The second personal thing I'd like to say, and by the way, you must read A.W. Singham's writings, particularly his book on Namibia, which was uh, a very important defense of SWAPO, the Southwest African People's Organization. I think that's an era where America really needs to look again at its imperialism and understand how America was so much on behalf of the apartheid South Africans and the racist Namibian elite against groups like SWAPO. So I really encourage you to go and read uh, Archie's book on Namibia. It's an instructive text. Um, the second thing is that this is the 30th anniversary of Robin Kelly and my friendship. Right. So That's we true. might, yes, indeed, last month actually. Uh, right. So uh, we might actually look quite young. But, <laughs> but you were young. Uh, you were we young. were young. Maybe you were also young. I wasn't. Uh, Lisa is in the room, and Lisa, Ruthie Gilmore, uh, Vincent Harding, who had just written the foreword to uh, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa for Harvard University Press. Uh, we were all at a very nice conference organized by our friends, as I said, Ruthie Gilmore, who turned 38 that weekend, actually, of the conference. Uh, I'm giving away her age. Sorry, Ruthie. Uh, and uh, Sid Lamel. Uh, and it was a conference on Pan-Africanism in 1988. Now, you've got to understand the context. Rodney had been assassinated in 1980. But... Thomas Sankara had been assassinated in 1987. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to remember that, you know, it's one thing to recognize that a continent like Africa has struggled in its post-colonial period from, let's say, when independence began to come, firstly in the Gold Coast, Ghana, and then others. It's really important to understand how the Africans have struggled to create an independent path for Africa, and how imperialism has routinely and ruthlessly cut off the fruits of that struggle from Patrice Lumumba 1961 to Sankara 1987. And I have to say, and I want to say it very strongly, that we've forgotten how brutal imperialism was and is. And today, people have such a callous attitude towards imperialism. And I want to say this because I think you can't read Rodney. You really can't understand Walter Rodney unless you understand what it means to hate imperialism. Mm -hmm. If you have 
a very soft attitude. If you believe, for instance, that the American government, you know, has good people in it. <laughs> if you believe, for instance, right. that you know, people say this silly thing like there's a war in Syria, we should do something, by which they mean the Americans should bomb. Or we should do something in Libya as if the Americans should bomb. And that this bombing is somehow prophylactic mm -hmm. and is helping the Libyans and the Syrians and so and so. If you believe that, I strongly encourage you not to pick up a Rodney book because <laughs> you're not prepared to read Rodney. You shouldn't read Rodney. In fact, you'll abuse Rodney by reading him. So I encourage you, if you think that imperialism is not a brutal system, I encourage you not to buy the book. I'm sorry, Ben and others at Verso, <laughs> but, but I think this is important because, because it's one thing to have a posture of anti-imperialism and radicalism, and it's another thing to actually believe, as Rodney believed, that imperialism never let the continent develop an independent path. And the assassination of Sankara in 87 was really symbolic of the attempt to cut off an alternative because Thomas Sankara, not an individual, but somebody who spoke for a movement, came to the United Nations and laid out one of the most sophisticated critiques of the international so-called trade system, which is really an international system of plunder and theft, not trade. Trade is such a banal word such a technical word, you know, we talk about trade, mm -hmm. development, economics. We should be talking about theft, plunder, mm -hmm. you know, the production of backwardness. Because backwardness was not a word that Rodney was afraid of. When you read how Europe underdeveloped Africa, you'll find lyrical passages where Rodney talks about how people were rendered illiterate. You see, what happened with the kind of culturalist turn is we, we became embarrassed about talking about backwardness. We wanted to say everybody's actually progress in the same place in time and history. That's not true. In Zambia, 60% of children who live above the copper cannot read. So don't patronize the children of Zambia by saying, you know, Zambia is as, as developed as anywhere else. It's not. It's been theft. It's been a product of theft. Right. Its copper has been stolen, not just by Chinese companies, but by Canadian companies and Swiss companies and American financiers. So what I'd like to say, sorry, I'm saying this before I get to Rodney, <laughs> <laughs> that to read Rodney, you have to prepare yourself. Right. Because to read Rodney, you have to be ready to encounter an anti-imperialist. You know, every author of this kind who I would suggest is actually quite a strong author, you know, not somebody in the world of normal science, to borrow from Thomas Kuhn, but a paradigm breaker like Rodney. Rodney was a paradigm breaker. Rodney has to have you prepare before you read him. And the preparation requires a kind of political preparation. You need to put yourself into the shoes of those children in Zambia and understand what it means to live above copper but not be able to read the contracts written by your government that basically gives the copper away to Canadian copper companies whose government is run by a man who may be sexy and so on, but is nonetheless a part of the structure of imperialism. When Robin and Jesse and I were talking about this book, I mean, it's amazing because, you see, it's so interesting, and I'm so glad the subtitle is A View from the Third World. I'm so glad about that, because the reflections, even from the left of the Russian Revolution, a hundred years after that important, decisive event, the reflections from the left have been pathetic. Mm -hmm. I mean, people cannot understand what it means for peasants to overthrow autocracy. You know, you don't want to spend even a minute celebrating this peasant rebellion against autocracy. You want immediately to start criticizing what happened in the Soviet Union. Because you want to be yourself pure of the complexities of what it means to produce a revolution. Rodney says in this book, revolutions are about transformation. And transformation is a process. It's not about moving from criminality to purity. When you move to the other side of history, when you open up a new epoch, you will still be stuck 
with your feet in clay in all the contradictions of the past and you're going to have to struggle you're going to have to learn how to walk out of the clay and i think that a lot of people 100 years later reflecting on the ussr have been unable to see what it what it meant for peasants to make a revolution you know for for the leadership of the ussr to come from the children of cobblers the children of small peasants that was the leadership of the ussr it's a little bit like the attitude today in venezuela towards nicolas maduro who the elite in Medu Venezuela hate because he was a bus driver. I mean, how dare bus driver cross the oligarchy? You know, the kind of language they use about him, they call him a monkey and so on. That's how people refer to the leadership in the USSR, because these people came from the soil and they were bound to make mistakes. And do you know why they made mistakes? And this is the last thing I'll say, because it's really important to Rodney's stance, as it were, towards socialism and communism. You've got to remember that the early revolutions of the 20th century, whether it's Mexico or it's China in 1911, the first revolutions in Mexico, China, Iran, 1911, the Soviet Union in 1917, then China itself, no, sorry, 1918, how can I forget, in Mongolia, the second major socialist revolution. Then China, 1949, eventually Cuba, 59, Vietnam, 75. My friends, these are all in peasant societies. These are not in advanced industrial states. These are in places where Marx didn't anticipate the revolution to happen directly. He understood the capability of these places to move to revolution. Rodney is lecturing in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. He has himself written very important studies by the 1970s about agriculture in Africa. He understands that the African revolution is by and large a peasant revolution. Mm -hmm. It is not a revolution of the industrial proletariat. He's sympathetic to the fact that most revolutions have been in one sense, even though they didn't use the term because they happened in 1911, some of them, they were Leninist revolutions because they believed that the agent of history was the working class and the peasantry. This Rodney is seized of. And this is another point that the metropolitan left and liberals and others who are reflecting back 100 years have failed to see how remarkable it was that in far-flung regions of the Russian Empire, peasants rose up against the feudal landlords. This was not solely a movement in St. Petersburg. This was a movement in Kazakhstan. Mm. This was a movement in Uzbekistan. This was a movement where people with very little understanding of Marxism rose up against their feudal lords. And I think Rodney really understood this. And his theory, in a sense, of the Russian Revolution was in that way very much a Leninist theory. So I would say, friends, if you're going to get this book, because I'm telling you, it's one of the most emotional things for me to have this book published. Mm. You know, it's incredible, the incredible feeling. Mm -hmm. If you're going to read this book, do Rodney a favor. Read this book as an anti-imperialist. Don't read this book as a liberal. Thanks. <laughs> See, now, in the original plan, um, I was going to go first. <laughs> so... Christina totally jacked me up. <laughs> um, and so I don't know how I'm, gonna, how I'm gonna follow that. But let me just say a few things. This, this is very, very difficult for me. Um, before we get into Rod Rodney, just in responding to, to Vijay's profound and important um, and moving, moving commentary, one of the things he talks about, um, it re actually I should say, it reminds me of another unpublished book that Versa may consider publishing. And that is, um, W.B. Du Bois wrote a book called Russia and America. And, um, one, and there's a wonderful, there's a wonderful um, chapter about that unpublished text uh, in Vaughn Raspberry's book called Race in a Totalitarian Century, where he, call, he says, what Du Bois argued was that, he talked about the right to, the, the, the right to fail. And that part of understanding the Soviet experiment is recognizing the right to fail, the right to actually make an attempt and actually fail 
as part of the transformative process. And that book has never been published because, of course, everyone thinks it's going to be an embarrassment to Du Bois because it's a defense of Stalinism. It, and not so much a defense of all of Stalinism. It's a defense of the Soviet experiment. So I just want to remind us of that and also say that um, if you're going to read as an anti-imperialist, make sure you read Red Star Over the Third World. Okay, get that book, which I'm actually reviewing it for um, some publication. I'm still working on that, among other things. Um, so let me tell you the story about how I came to this book, because I have a very long history with it. Uh, in 1984, I was a graduate student at UCLA. Sid Lamell was there um, back in those days, my best friend on campus. And um, Ned Alpers, who's a professor of African history, that he was my advisor, because I actually came to UCLA to study African history. Um, I switched fields for various reasons which are not important. But my first job as a research assistant was to work on Walter Rodney's papers. So uh, Pat Rodney, his widow, had you know, fled Guyana, had all his materials, and kind of plopped them in Ned Alpers' office at UCLA. Now keep in mind, this is 1984. This is only four years after his assassination. And I'm, I was a very young graduate student, I should say. I, I finished college very young. Um, I was basically not, like 21 years old, 22 years old, going to graduate school. Uh, and I had this job, and my job was to take these files that were uh, Rodney's lectures on the Russian Revolution. No one knew where they were from or what, when they were actually delivered that came later, um, and basically type them onto what, and young people don't know about this, they used to have floppy disks, okay? And they really were floppy. And I had a computer for the first time, and basically, we didn't have scanners, there were no scanners. So I typed word for word, and edit, and track down citations. And this is very, very important because there were no footnotes in these lectures. There were about 20 lectures altogether. Some of them were in the form of prose, some of them were just outlines. It was just basically a lot of material, but it was meant to be lectures. And you'd have these like little notations on the side, maybe the, an author or something, and you'd have these long quotes. So I had to track down these quotes in an age when nothing was searchable except going into the library. So I went into the library and read all this Russian history to try to find where he got this material. Um, hundreds of books. I got bronchitis as a result. I remember spending months. And I was working on this, and the idea was to turn these lectures into a book somehow. It was very clear that Rodney had intended to do this because um, among his papers was a handwritten preface that he titled Two World Views of the Russian Revolution's Revolution Reflections from Africa. And that was the title that he was working with at the time. Um, what we found out later, you know, in doing research, I'll tell you how we got to later, uh, is that he not only intended to write this book, but it was going to precede how Europe underdeveloped Africa. He was actually in the midst of trying to turn these lectures into the book when he decided, you know what, I need to work on the African material first. And so imagine what it means for those of you who are trying to be professors or whatever that means, uh, to have your PhD, you know, he was 20, 24 years old, he has a job, he publishes his dissertation, and he goes immediately to Russian history. Um, how did he come across this? Well, he was teaching a seminar uh, on historians and revolution. The first, the first semester, uh, and this is at University of Dar es Salaam, was on the French Revolution, the second semester on the Russian Revolution. And he read everything he can get his hands on. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So I basically worked, maybe got through maybe a little less than half of the material, uh, light editing, citations, and that sort of thing. And then Pat left, and she took the papers with her. And that was the end of that. And I had a copy of the, of the manuscript I was working with for years. And I remember giving one copy to Rupert Lewis. Uh, this is back in the days before you had, again, nothing was digital. So you actually made photocopies, and you'd like send them to people. So Rupert Lewis had a copy, and then Dave Rodiger had a copy. I gave it to him years later, and I lost my copy. So fast forward, um, the Rodney family had found uh, what was essentially my annotated versions and edited versions of the lectures, and they thought they were Rodney's. And it wasn't clear 
you know, what, who did the footnotes? And I said, like, I did the footnotes, you know? <laughs> and so we got into a conversation years later, and as a result of that, which the details are not that important, we all collaborated on, on trying to get this book done, uh, which took a lot of time and a lot of energy. And Vijay was very uh, fundamental in terms of making the connection to Verso, in terms of giving us encouragement to get this thing published. Um, and I remember sending him some of the raw uh, uh, lectures and, and having conversation about it. So that was very, very important for him. So let me just say a couple things about the context for this. Um, there's the context for me, and there's a the context for Rodney. So the context for me is, this is 19, I mean, you talk about assassinations. This is 1984. Maurice Bishop was assassinated in 1983. The New Jewel movement had been crushed. This was the hope for my generation in terms of what socialism could look like, right? This is the invasion of Grenada. Um, and keep in mind that in 1984, this was before uh, Gorbachev, before the fall of the Soviet Union, um, you know, this was a time when many of us, myself included, were in marxist leninist organizations, okay? And I was very active in one. I won't even name it, though you could look it up. Um, and we're all having these struggles, different line struggles. Um, and we actually believed, and many of us still believe, in the mid-1980s that we were on the winning side. No one imagined what was gonna happen in terms of the collapse of the Soviet bloc. We thought we were on the winning side. Not to say that we identify with the Soviet bloc, but that, that Marxism, socialism was, was on the winning side. This was also the ramping up of the Cold War under Reagan. This is also the period where the evidence that we were winning didn't come from Europe, it came from Africa. It came from the Caribbean, right? That's the evidence. South Africa was the evidence that we were winning. Okay, so even after the fall of the Soviet Union, we still thought we were winning. Um, I'm gonna skip over um, the Bible. I'm gonna say a few things about the book and the way the book's organized. Um, so Rodney's objectives in doing this book was manyfold. One, he wanted to introduce students, uh, readers, uh, and students in his class to historical materialism as a methodology for interpreting revolutionary movements. Uh, he had a lot of the book is critiques of bourgeois historians, assessments and critiques of Soviet historians, and then assessments and critiques of those independent Marxist historians, people uh, like Maurice Dobb and others, and people like E.H. Carr as a, a left liberal, uh, and trying to figure out like what is, you know, he, he was critiquing bourgeois historians and the liberal conceits of objectivity. So there's a lot of humor in the book. Um, and, and Rodney, if you read How Europe Ended Up After, you know he's very funny. And he has biting, biting, biting humor and criticisms um, of those bourgeois historians. And so he's also looking at all this. <coughs> um, in their interpretations post-1956. <coughs> Hold on one second. So he's trying to reread the material <coughs> and draw lessons for the third world, which is why, again, the subtitle is actually very, very important. The lectures were not so much about 1917, <coughs> but rather takes a very long view. He devotes a lot of space to the formation of the Russian Empire and its unique form of settler colonialism, because he saw, um, as, as Vijay was saying, there are multiple fronts of struggle, and one of those fronts is an anti-imperialist struggle within the Russian Empire as one of the sources of what becomes 1917. He looks at issues of the subordination of uh, settler colonialism to, to foreign capital. <coughs> I know I got, um, I'm sick. So, okay. He talks about the rise of the Russian left intelligentsia the Narodnik uh, movement, the 1905 revolution, um, the events in 1917, he asked really pointed questions about the inevitability of the revolution. Uh, he makes a distinction between the February and the October revolutions. The February is a bourgeois revolution, October is proletarian. He defends Lenin's decision to dissolve the Constituent Assembly. He looks with a critical eye at Lenin's new economic policy, um, the rise of Stalinism, and, um, and the arguments about socialism in one country. 
In some ways, he's very critical of Trotsky. In other ways, he does praise him as being really a premier historian in terms of capturing certain elements, particularly when Trotsky and Lenin are on the same page. Um, and he talks about the collectivization of agriculture, which is a very important issue because, of course, what is he dealing with uh, in Tanzania? He's dealing with what it means to transform a, a backwards empire, in the case of, of Russia, into a social state. What does it mean to transform a backward former colony into a modern African social state? That is, how to deal with the peasantry. Um, what does it mean to create the Ujamaa villages? What is required? Where's the role of violence and coercion in this? And he does, just to be clear, um, on the question of violence and coercion, he makes a distinction between the social violence necessary to overthrow a regime, but then argues that um, social violence should not be necessary in order to create transformation. Mm -hmm. In other words, the state shouldn't use violence in order to force people to do things that, they, that, that are necessary for transformation. There are other forms of, of pressure. So these are the things he talks about. Um, and I don't want to go on too long, but I want to say a few things uh, about, about the significance of the book for now, but also I'm, I'm a little bit wary of reading too much into this book as the, um, the blueprint for the next movement. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to take these amazing historical documents and take them out of their context. And that's kind of undialectical thinking. To think dialectically is to understand what is his context. Why was he so ferociously anti-imperialist? What was that about? And to understand that, that's why I really want to emphasize in the last remarks I want to make, because we sometimes tend to overlook the things that are problematic about his analysis, and when we don't overlook them, we dismiss it. And so the things that we may disagree with his analysis um, doesn't mean it's not really valuable to understand. On the contrary, it's incredibly valuable to understand and appropriate in this time, place, condition. But if we, so we can't do both those things. And I totally agree with, with um, what Vijay says. Um, part of the, the, the whole year-long reassessment of the Soviet Union in, the in 1917 has been a way of distancing themselves from the revolution, a way of making this distance without actually understanding what were the constraints they were up against. In other words, the right to fail. Mm. So I want to... I want us to be mindful of that and also be mindful of the fact that imagine what it meant to write this book uh, in Dar es Salaam. You pretty much did all the research in about a year, maybe a year and a half. Um, of course, he'd been reading on the Russian Revolution for a long time, but it's in the, course of, in the, in the, in the context of teaching his course. But he, what did he have access to? He had access to the libraries at, US, at the University of Dar es Salaam. He did not have access to the Soviet archives. They were not available. He didn't have access to all the scholarship that was produced after the fact. A whole um, uh, a cottage industry of, of books and articles that came out. He had a very limited access, and despite that, he did much like what Du Bois did with Black Reconstruction. Black, Re Black Reconstruction, Du Bois only had limited access to materials and wrote this mag magnificent book. His point wasn't to reconstruct the history, but to rethink its produ the production of that history and its political meaning. So in other words, um, I think there are valuable lessons about where the left was in the 1970s, and not just the left, the third world left, and to recognize the limits of imagination in that time, place, and condition. In other words, we could learn uh, you know, what old ideas need to be abandoned. I'll give you some examples. Keep in mind that when he gave those lectures, this is like 1971, 7071 was when he taught the course. This was only three, four years after the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution of 1917. The political winds were shifting toward Marxism Leninism. Now, if you think that we thought we we're going to win in 1984, for damn sure they thought they're going to win in 1970, because that's what it looked like. I dare anyone to go back in time and stand there and see what it looks like. Capitalists are losing in 1970. The whole world is in crisis. It's socialists that are winning. They're on the winning side. So imagine the question of the socialist path 
wasn't settled in Africa, but it was the winning position in Mozambique, in Guinea-Bissau, in Angola, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in the People's Republic of the Congo, in the Western Sahara. You can go on and on and on in, in Ethiopia. We could talk, not to mention Vietnam. Um, we also had the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Uh, in the midst of, you know, the, the last vestiges of that is taking place as he's beginning this project. Um, China's African interventions, along with the Soviets, um, and closer to home, Tanzania's own socialist path. And one of the things we talk, that I talk about in, in the introduction is there's a sharp distinction between C.L.R. James's position and Rodney's position, and I go into details about that, we could do that in discussion, but one of the explanations for that difference, and one of the reasons why um, Rodney is actually far more um, sympathetic not to Stalin the person, but to the regime, is because he's actually in a country trying to build socialism mm -hmm. under constraints that were enormous. Versus James, who's, look, I love James, he is, he's, he's never had that experience of being in a country trying to build socialism. He would visit, but it's not the same thing. So what are some of the limitations? Well, one of the limitations uh, for the left in that period, and Rodney is a product of that, is uh, a focus on producerism. Producerism, that is, that's one of the things that the socialist um, ideologues in the Keynesian state had in, in common, except producerism for different things. Um, Rodney was impressed with the Soviet economy and its emphasis on growth, mm -hmm. investment, rising incomes, its focus on heavy industry, its ability to avoid periodic crises and depressions, right? And that made perfect, perfect sense. We, today, we could talk about um, the, the, the challenges to things like rapid mass production, speed ups, alienation caused by division of labor, the stuff that young Marx was interested in. We could talk about the environmental and ecological damage, but when you're standing in 1970 or 71, production is the way to solve the problem of poverty, to solve the problem of want, okay? Um, but in this era of neocolonialism, of dependency of global poverty, he makes a very strong case for the command economy's role in solving, uh, not just solving, but maintaining a humane standard of living. And for him, this is a critical lesson for the colonized world. So who is he resisting? He's resisting bourgeois historians and economists who claim that Soviet planning slows growth, suppresses scientific developments, reduces worker productivity, and produces little more than a miseration of the masses. And he's saying, but that's not really the case. Again, we could step back here in 2018 and talk about all the things that are problem problematic about producerism, but in that context, there's a certain logic to it. So finally, there's some important, important things we could think about today. Can we speak of socialist revolution anymore? What does that look like? Well, we, we're living in a world where socialist revolution is supposed to be Bernie Sanders. I mean, really? That's a very different way of thinking about this. So you think, well, what are the models? The former socialist countries, uh, you know, many of them have become models of neoliberalism, um, except for maybe Cuba, and that looks like it's about to change. The Bolivarian revolutions came very close, but they also, you know, would left social democratic experiments, often with weak democratic foundations that are really struggling in this world uh, that's hostile to them. Um, he also reminds us of the importance of revolution. And I mean revolution, really revolution, because this is, it's, it's ironic, and I, I've never read this anywhere, and I'm sure people have written it, but there seems to be a kind of unstated acceptance, at least in the US and in the West, of what we used to call Bernsteinism, mm -hmm. or Kautskyism, that is, the notion that socialism can be voted through, uh, voted in, or through constitutional parliamentary means. And it reminds us that making revolution is more than having self-proclaimed socialists dominating legislative chambers, that it really is about a transformation and that there's, uh, there's a cost to that, and we have to, to do that. Um, so uh, if you indulge me, I just want to end by just reading one paragraph from this, because I think it, it from the introduction, because it sort of speaks to what um, I think Rodney was trying to do. Let's see. Um, so the point as I write, the point of this book is not to write socialism's epitaph, nor to reminisce in the glory of October. To study the Russian Revolution, Rodney insists, is not to emulate it, 
There are lessons to be learned, and the principle of socialism must be defended, but African and third world revolutionaries cannot slavishly adopt it as a model. Or as Rupert Lewis put it, the most important aspect of Rodney's approach to the Russian Revolution was that its experience and lessons could not be mechanically applied to the African continent. Third world revolutionaries need Marxism, but Rodney wisely counsels that we need to be wary of either Marxist, of a, a Marxist view through a distorted bourgeois lens or the Soviet view, despite being very close because of the similarity of our present and past with their past in the period under study. He ends on a profoundly reflective note, and he writes, assuming a view springing from some socialist variant is not necessarily Marxist, but anti-capitalist, assuming a view that is at least radical humanist, then the Soviet Revolution of 1917 and the sub subsequent construction of socialism emerges as a very positive historical experience from which we ourselves can derive a great deal as we move to confront similar problems. So I'll stop there and we can have a conversation. Thank you. Thanks. So I actually want to pick up right where you left off, uh, Robin, and say, you know, throughout the text, we're cautioned against uh, easy mechanical historical transpositions. Rodney says, that you can't simply take the history of the Russian Revolution and apply it directly to Tanzania any more than the Bolsheviks could just apply the lessons and the histories of the French Revolution or the English Civil War directly to their own conditions. Um, and he emphasizes a different kind of analysis is necessary, and as you both have mentioned, the text is as much about the Russian Revolution as it is a guide for conducting a historical materialist mm -hmm. analysis. So I wonder, in this moment, as social movements are really struggling to both think through the past and also link struggles, for example, between Ferguson, Palestine, Standing Rock, Kurdistan, et cetera, et cetera. How does a historical materialist analysis help us, especially the one that Rodney's illustrating, how does it help us understand our own situation? Uh, well, it's exciting to think <laughs> about those ideas given that we are presenting Rodney's book uh, I can well imagine that if he wasn't b killed by the dark side of history, uh, he would have continued to pursue exactly this question. Because it really is the heart and soul of the Marxist project. Mm -hmm. You know, the Marxist project is a project that is not religious. In other words, it is to confront reality and to confront our weakness always in order to build strength. I mean, that's the heart of the project. Uh, you know, uh, somebody like, if you take the career of a thinker like Lenin, the entire career from at least the writings on uh, capitalism in Russia till 1917 is about confronting our weakness. Mm -hmm. It's not bragging about our strength. You know, it's from a direct and honest and sober confrontation of how, you know, the working class and the peasantry has been weakened by the system that we're able to build strength and move forward. So in that sense, I think, you know, it's one thing to say we have all solidarity with each other, but I would suggest that intellectually, one of the tasks of the present is to try and better understand at least two phenomena. One is the actual nature of contemporary capitalism. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting how much work is done at a macro level, and then there, are, then there is work at a micro level. But we're not building our theories from a close understanding of uh, developments that are taking place from between the macro and the micro. You know, there is a kind of divide. Some people are doing local history, some people are doing big theory studies and so on. So one of the lessons, not only of Marx, because this is exactly Marx's project, but in the Marxist tradition, you know, the living soul of Marxism, Maria Tegwe and others, the project is to understand capitalism in its current phase firstly, right. and secondly, to understand how capitalism decomposes the key classes. You see, that's the intellectual piece of it. It's the part for the working movements to recompose the working class and the peasantry. In other words, intellectuals have a specific task. And you know, when you read let's say the entire writings of somebody like Rodney, died very young, he died at 39, he was killed at age 39. You know, Fanon died at what, 36? I mean, these people lived incredibly short lives. Um, 
the, their work, I think, was precisely to document in some way, to make us understand how this system that we live under weakens the possibility of revolution. And if we understand the structure of our weakness, it is then up to the people's movements to give confidence to people through, I think, very deliberate and precise struggles. You know, there's no point building struggles around everything. Mm -hmm. You have to be strategic of how you build your struggles, to, to gather strength, to create confidence. I mean, a category that I hope people use with much more uh, frequency is the concept of confidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, the issue is that it's not a question merely of building the consciousness of people, it's also their confidence. I mean, every struggle, as people know who have taken part in struggles, whether it's to build trade unions on your graduate schools or you know, whether you're building any kind of struggle, Black Lives Matter and so on, you remember the first day you went for a demonstration, how scary that was, mm -hmm. and how you were glad that a friend came with you or somebody, because you were not sure exactly what this breed is of activists. Would you get arrested? Would somebody hit you? Would you get hurt? You know, the idea of building Confidence is actually lived through that experience, right. I would suggest. Yeah. So when you ask a question like that, I, I would say that it's the intellectual's task to not understand, to not just document where workers are strong or where peasants are strong or where people's movements are strong, but to document our weakness and not to document our weakness to make us feel bad, but to assist movements to strategically build those movements. So I would right. say that should be our task today, and it seems to me that's very much on the agenda for the, at least, the radicals in the third world in, into the 1970s. Right, right. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with everything there, especially in terms of our tasks. In terms of the one part of the question you asked, that is, what is the role of historical materialism? And this is where I'm gonna get myself in trouble, but you know what, I have a flight tomorrow, so you can't beat me <laughs> up. Um, is that I don't think historical materialism has a role. I actually think um, it's, historical materialism has, has outlived its usefulness. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, thinking dialectically has not. Um, one of the things that I disagree with that, um, again, makes perfect sense in terms of Rodney's place, time, and, and training, he has a line in the text where he says, you know, um, he's making a very kind of thumbnail sketch of, of what it means, the distinction between idealism and materialism. And he says, um, matter precedes ideas. He's saying that you know, basically all ideas are products of material conditions, all ideas. And I actually, I, mean, I was trained by Cedric Robinson, who says that's not necessarily the case. That he thinks a little bit more, I die. So if you go back to the question of confidence, confidence is something that not necessarily is produced by material conditions. It's in some ways produced in consciousness in a collective sort of way, which is tied to things that may not have any relationship to material conditions. It may be the way that people think and dream and, and live together and re relate to one another. It may be what you know, Cedric talks about when he talks about the on, on to, ontological totality. Um, that is to say, um, what, is the f what forms um, a people's I thinking and ideas and analysis that may not, that doesn't necessarily reduce them to their place in the mode of production. Uh, and so when Cedric says, you know, the proletariat is not a you know, universal subject, Marx says basically the same thing too. And, and, and there's a moment where, you know, even Walter, uh, in quoting Marx's reading of the peasantry, says, you know what, it, Marx, he said, Marx even says, look, I wrote about Western Europe, it doesn't apply to everywhere, you know? And I think that in the world that we're living in, um, sometimes, if we can no longer proceed from the position that we begin first by understanding only the objective material conditions as if it's gonna produce an outcome. I think that what Walter's own life demonstrates is the limitations of historical materialism. Walter's own life, that, you know, Walter's own work as an Africanist, you know, suggests that uh, dialectical thinking is important, but we've gotta go even deeper in understanding that um, ideas have materiality, material power. And again, that's not necessarily inconsistent with young Marx. Um, well, okay, Th this leads me to, uh, I think, a related question about scale. You know, this book comes at such an interesting moment. I think there's a real preference among the 
English-speaking North American left for forms of radicalism that emphasize small-scale collectives, mm -hmm. marinage, utopias, the politics of the peripheries. And while these projects all oppose capitalism, these visions often fall in alignment with a neoliberal state that encourages informal mutual support networks while it ravages the social infrastructure. So I wonder what a return to Walter Rodney with his big questions about state power, revolution, and organizing mass class alliances means at this particular moment. I mean, <laughs> firstly, I mean, everybody has a different role. So mm. some people might be more confident and comfortable working at different scales, which is important because in the journey of our radicalism, I think we learn something from small scale experiments. So there is some value to that. I mean, for instance, from Leftward, we just published a book on, a, on one of the oldest cooperatives in India, a construction workers mm -hmm. cooperative, which is continuing to function today. The book is called uh, Alternative, uh, Development Alternatives. Very good book. Why I'm saying that is that I think that we are at a particularly cruel stage of human history mm. where all kinds of radicalism is necessary at all fronts, you know. Uh, but I think I would suggest that exclusive concentration on one front or one scale or the other is the problem. Right. And right. that I think to believe that you don't have to engage the state is a surrender in some way. Right. I mean. It's okay, and it may be the case that in Vermont or in places like that, you know, small-scale activity is possible and has real tangible effects to help poor people who are starving in a small state like that in the United States. But let's take the case of India. 700 people have gone to sleep this night hungry. 700 million people. You know, that's almost one in two Indians. That's twice the population of the United States. Now, we don't talk about poverty in India mm -hmm. anymore because the bourgeois media tends to focus on other things. And those who concentrate on poverty in India are quite irritating because they just moralize about the issue. You know, they'll either say that, you know, let's do something, raise some funds, buy a child, that sort right, of right, thing. Right. right. <laughs> but this is a problem that cannot be tackled in a small scale way. It requires a very big scale intervention. But remember, Lula in Brazil attempted one of the most heroic anti-hunger initiatives. Even though he did it in a social democratic framework, Fome hunger, zero hunger, was a very crucial policy. And I think, you know, the Brazilians will have an election in October. Lula has been illegally put in prison I'm really quite surprised that there is not a hue and cry among left forces in the United States about this theft of democracy, this soft coup or whatever it's called, golpo suave, so, sounds so great in Portuguese, golpo mm. suave, this soft coup in Brazil. I mean, in Brazil, they were able through state power in a social democratic framework to remove Brazil from the world hunger map. And after this so-called soft coup, Brazil has crept up and will be returned to the world hunger map. So what I would say is that let's not be too sectarian in our attitude towards different scales of change. I think we should really welcome it when people work in any scale where they are comfortable. Let's try to learn from their experiments and see what is, you know, can be made in a mass level, what cannot be, what can only be done at a small scale level. Let's study these things carefully. Let's spend some time and energy looking at these things with seriousness. But friends, when some of our comrades, such as in Brazil, attempt a large scale experiment, when they are overthrown, don't wipe your hands on your pants and walk away saying, well, they made X, Y, Z mistakes. Right. Because you know that is really the most irritating thing about how solidarity is understood today. You know, people just want purity. They don't understand, as Robin was saying, they don't understand the muck of making a change. So I think your assessment of James and Rodney is spot on. Again, I think James is a brilliant person, and I see you've written the foreword to Paul Buell's 
reissued book. Yeah. It's a great book. You should read it. James is a very important intellectual, but it's absolutely spot on that he didn't have the experiences of you know, mm -hmm. confronting every day, walking from Rodney's house to the University of Dar es Salaam up that hill. You know, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry, that's me. Up that hill every day uh, and encountering right. you know, on that hill poverty. And I think that's why I would be a little sympathetic to the multiplicity of our... Story. I mean, for God's yeah. sake, get involved yeah. at any scale. Exactly. But get involved. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's true. That's true. I, I totally agree. In fact, <laughs> let me just say... Um, yeah. I'm 100% behind that. In fact, I would even add that um, it's not as if neoliberalism doesn't scale up. We have China. You know, I mean, you know, all the possibilities of state power in the name of socialism is also captured by neoliberalism. So I don't know if it's necessarily about small scale. I completely agree. And I think there's two things I would add to that. One is we've got to pay attention to those attempts that actually are a combination of small scale and governance. And I think about Jackson, Mississippi, in the attempt to create a kind of cooperative commonwealth. And, and Jackson has his struggles right now, all kinds of contradictions and struggles going on. But this is a case of governing, trying to govern on the one hand at a, at a city scale, but also trying to develop forms of production in, in, um, in survival, not just survival, but ways of actually distributing wealth and creating, uh, ending poverty and creating uh, homes for people who don't have homes with limited resources available. We have to pay attention and we have to support them. So I think about what we often don't talk about is where solidarity sometimes has all this possibility when people emerge from the globe and center in a particular place. Um, Cuba, Vince Ramos, the idea of people coming to Cuba to sort of build socialism. Guatemala in 1954, the overthrow of the regime in Guatemala, it, was, it wasn't just about United Fruit, it was about the fact that Guatemala became the center for a lot of Latin American radicals to organize there. It's Guatemala is where, um, you know, Castro and Che Guevara and others had their base. Uh, you think about the Spanish Civil War and what it meant to have international brigades to defend something that could be a socialist experiment, whatever contradictions within that. So Vijay is absolutely right. We, we need to think about Chiapas. We, there's so many other examples of moments in where what, we, what appears to be small scale is actually at a global scale. As long as we can be connected, as long as we're willing to defend those struggles, and it's a very hard thing to do when terms like internationalism um, don't have the same meaning or cachet or strength. And that's where, uh, at the, again, go back to the Rodney book, he opens up the book in that first chapter talking about what is black studies. And he says, you know, black studies is not just the study of black people, it's the study of the world from our perspective. And that's why I'm writing this book about the Russian Revolution. So we need to do that instead of sort of falling back. Because the, the, the question of scale and the question of perspective isn't just about organizing or creating experiments of cooperation, it's a, our intellectual scale, which I think is often limited. Nice. Um, so, um, I will open it up to questions, but this is such a rare opportunity that I get to grill these two when I'm so often grilled by them. I'm just going to stretch this out as long as I can. Okay, so I have a question uh, for both of you about uh, gender. Uh, Robin, as you note in the intro, the February Revolution was kicked off by female textile workers and housewives in Petrograd who were protesting bread shortages and celebrating the first International Working Women's Day. And of course, as I've learned from both your work, Bolshevism itself upturned gendered property relations, gendered labor regimes, gendered relations of social reproduction, and as Bolsheviks like Alexander Kolontai, uh, you know, in texts like uh, Sexuality and the Class Struggle, um, notes that Bolshevism also challenged gendered social roles and uh, sexual norms. So I wanted to invite both of you to describe how an analysis of gender helps us better understand Rodney's project to theorize revolutionary class alliances, and also, um, just picking up on your point, Vijay, um, how it helps us better understand uh, an analysis of a recomposition of the class at the present. Are we again going with me first? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, w <laughs> so, you know, class is an interesting uh, concept because 
it's very difficult if you have experience in working class struggles. Class is not actually an identity. You know how funny people sometimes say racism, sexism, classism. It's a very odd feeling. It has always struck me as wrong. Classism. I understand what it means. I mean, you know, bourgeois disdain for somebody who comes from a different background. I get it. Okay, I'm not silly, but there's something not right about it. It's not a sequence. I mean, and one of the reasons, Christina, why I don't think it's a sequence is that I feel like people experience class through social identities. So whether it's through racial hierarchies or caste hierarchies or gender or different social hierarchies is the way in which people experience class. Like, you know, this is a good way to look at, say, memoirs or fiction where people talk about discrimination. You know, they don't talk about discrimination in an analytic way. They talk about discri uh, discrimination in a concrete way. You know, factory workers will say, why did you talk to me like that? When I did my first PhD on sanitation workers in India, I remember reading the strike demands. And they would all start with, the first demand was, just like the sanitation strike in Memphis. Hmm. First demand was, we want to be treated as humans. Now, what the hell does this have to do with your pay struggle, your this struggle, your that struggle? You understand? But you can't actually come to questions of pay or questions of working condition without social hierarchy. So in that sense, I mean, if Marxism is honest about our own history, our actual work is often better than our theoretical production. You know, the theoretical production is often extraordinarily mechanical extraordinary mechanical. I mean, I first, before I read Marx, I read Bukharin. And I'm admitting it freely, ABCs <laughs> of communism, and also uh, CPSU history short course, history of the CPSU short course, which was uh, put together by Stalin. That was uh, introduction to Marxism. I mean, it's extraordinarily mechanical. And one of the reasons it's mechanical is comrades, they were also producing teaching materials. And if you know anything about teaching or had any experience in teaching, teaching is a profoundly mechanical exercise as well as eye-opening and all the other things we write in a, you know, when you write your reports about how was your teaching experience, you write all these fine things. I like to have, you know, my classroom is a dynamic place of, you know, mutual conversation and et cetera. In fact, if you face reality, it's pretty damn mechanical. You write that these are the three things that you need to pay attention. You know, there is a kind of didacticism in teaching. But our movements are always richer than that. And one of the tragedies of our movements is our people who have been leaders and intellectuals of our movement haven't taken the time to document the richness of the movements. And we've kind of replicated partly the mechanicalness of it. Right. And this is there in Rodney. I mean, it's OK to say it. Right. That there, is, there are times when he's just writing with a hammer. You know, he should write with a sickle. It's a much finer cut. It's a much finer cut than the hammer. So there is that. And, you know, when we come to questions of the social world, as it were, which is like two snakes wrapped against each other, you know, class and social hierarchy. If you look at Tanzania in the 1960s and 70s, you're not, you're not seeing a masculinist movement. I mean, Ujama and, it, and the critique of Ujama was a complicated movement. Mm. The critique of Ujama was led in many rural areas by women. You know, why were they uh, leading these? Because in so many places where land is being taken away, the frontline fighters happen to be women. You know, in so many places in the African continent today, in slum dwelling areas, the frontline fighters happen to be women. Now, they are not fighting there merely as women. They are fighting there in a very complicated set of social relationships, but they are engaging the class struggle as mothers, as, as they say in South Africa, gogos, grandmothers, and so on. This is how they engage the class struggle. And we have to have some sympathy and understanding when we write about things. We shouldn't be as sometimes mechanical as we get. So I, I think that that's an issue that we should own up to a little bit. Right. No, absolutely. I, I totally agree. And in fact, um, there's a couple, a couple of ways into this, you know. Um, there's, a, there's a way into it in terms of thinking about this text, and there's a way into it thinking about the Russian Revolution, 
and there's a way into it thinking about the implications of the text itself. So it is true that um, Rodney mentions in passing in the February Revolution that it was basically bread riots on uh, these textile workers uh, and what becomes International Women's Day um, that started, but it's very, it's very passing. It's just almost fleeting. And then he goes on to move to um, a kind of non-gendered sort of description of hunger so it goes from you know, bread riots and the fact that these women are at the forefront because their responsibility is to provide bread. Their responsibility, they see themselves as um, not just producers, but the, the domain of reproduction is the domain that they are responsible for. And so it passes very, very quickly. Uh, and so then from there, Rodney has a line, he says, you know, um, uh, in so many revolutions begin uh, with starvation or hunger or anger, he says, but that doesn't always translate into a revolution. So let's step back for a second and think about what is it, think about all the scholarship that's come out in the Russian Revolution since that. Um, well, Wendy's book, for example, is another example. But there's lots of scholarship that shows uh, that, you know, that that was truly a revolution in the potential for women's rights, that there's a discourse on women's rights in, in 1917 in the immediate aftermath, uh, that the, the, the socialist revolutionaries, the, the peasant organizations, had very strong uh, female leadership in part because uh, women were responsible for, again, they're the ones that have to have access to communal natural resources, they're the ones responsible for reproduction, reproducing labor power, uh, for caring for the land, for cultivation, and so much falls on them. But then we take one step further and realize that, according to Silvia Federici, so much of the practice of collectivity, that collective, the formation of collective households falls on women, you know? Um, and that here you have examples of organizing um, the revolution or revolutionary um, distribution or redistribution of resources not so much wealth, but basic resources, organized by women according to uh, gendered practices. Um, you think about, even to this day, women do most of their subsistence farming. Um, when we talk about what's the peasantry, who's the peasantry? Well, the peasantry could be very thorny. The peasantry oftentimes are women. Um, and again, even though we have a lot of, you have a whole discourse on the collectivization of agriculture, that discourse depends on an assumption of a male head of household, uh, the wealthy kulak, who basically owns lots of property and basically would not give that up because the kulak becomes a, a small capitalist. But what does that mean in terms of women's practice in terms of reproductive labor? So these are the things that we have to pay attention to. So the, the benefit of the book, I think, it opens up these discussions and forces us to move, move way beyond where Rodney is at the time, um, and that's okay. I mean, I think that's, that's perfectly fine, and that's really very, very important for us to have that kind of critique, and I agree with, with Vijay on this as well. Um, and finally, I think, you know, one of the benefits of this book, and I think it's a very, very important part of it, is that Rodney does get away from the heroism, the very masculine kind of image that we get from movies like Reds, you know, um, the, the, the version of the, the, um, the Warren Beatty version of the, of the revolution, where, you know, men and women, but most, mostly men are marching forward, taking state power, singing songs, and being very present. He, Rodney's talking about the mechanics of revolution. He's talking about who is in the room trying to make decisions about strategy. He's talking about who's actually, who has the right to vote and who's voting and participating. Um, these are questions that show just how much the revolution was truly a revolution that involves so many people across generation, uh, gender, uh, uh, from rural to, from countryside to city. And it reminds us too that no matter what people say about the Russian revolution, it was a mass movement. I mean, you're talking about when, when, when you have strike waves that involve 70% of the population as opposed to 20%, that's a mass movement, you know, and that's very rare. Okay. Mm. Well, let's take some questions from the audience. I don't know if someone's coming around with a mic. Yes, Ben? I see, I see a hand in the back. I know, I actually We're going to take three or four questions, uh, and then we're going to give the panel.
Thank you. Before I ask my question, I just wanted to share a bit of information. When Walter was offered the position to teach at the University of Guyana, mm -hmm. it was to teach a course on the Russian Revolution, not ah. to teach African history. Mm -hmm. And many people are not aware of that. Which leads me to a question that ties in with the initial question that was asked. The Walter Rodney that's in that book is fundamentally different from the Walter Rodney that's in the minds of people who claim to be Rodneyites, right. who claim to be um, supporters of Rodney in various kinds of ways, mm -hmm. whether it's academically, politically, or otherwise. And I'm concerned about how we bridge that gap between those, including the family, who speak of Walter, and ironically, they speak of him in the back of that very book, as an Africanist leaving out Walter's self-identification as a Marxist, and sometimes as a Marxist-Leninist. How do we bridge the Rodney that's in that book with the Rodney that's in the minds of people who are otherwise um, lovers of Rodney, for, you know, Follower, consider themselves to be his followers and, and so forth. Such a Thank good you. question. We're going to take three. Okay. Same kind of question. So it, I'm so glad you guys have this book. That's fabulous. It's great. Can't wait but, to read it. But, 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 <laughs> but the Rodney I knew who inspired me and my entire generation in Jamaica where I was in the West Indies, Rodney riots, first riots, we were all involved in was two Rodneys. One, he was the man who took the word to the people and he didn't do any of this academic bullshit. He wasn't an academic sitting around talking about what the revolution meant, Russian revolution and peasants and how, no, he really wanted to inspire the working class. So he started study groups in Avocat and in the ghettos in Jamaica and he taught us to do that. We all went and did that. It was real working class Marxism, it was not Verso books and all this, which makes me sad. I love Verso books, but it makes me sad about where we are today and what's happening and how does that work with the Rodney that we knew. And number two, the second part of Rodney that is really, really important was Rodney was the man who bridged the racial divide between Indians and Africans in the West Indies. And if we don't get over that, we ain't going nowhere. And he knew that and he really worked hard on that. And to, you know, so me too, I want to know whether that Rodney speaks in your book. Hope so. We can take one more question. Is we can right? take one more question. No, no, wait, this is coming. Let them, let them bring it. Then we can also think how to answer Shanti's question. Okay, mine is very simple. When Rodney was a student at uh, UWI, he traveled to the Soviet Union once, and I think to Cuba twice. Mm -hmm. Does this, is, did this have any effect or influence yeah. how he wrote this book? Yeah, yeah. In, fact, in fact, Vijay writes about it in his foreword, yeah. about his going to Cuba and, the, and, and Russia. Um, it doesn't come up so much um, in the intro because it's already covered in the, in the foreword, uh, but I should say, just by way of, of explanation in terms of the introduction, um, there's a lot more we could have done in terms of situating him specifically in time and place. And so we, for purposes of time and other things, we end up not doing that. There's a way does he situate in terms of, the, of, of his larger history, his broader history, which actually ties to this question, the first question, about how do we bridge the Rodney in this book uh, with the Rodney that people know. Um, I have a very simple answer for that, and I'm sure Vijay has a better answer than me, um, and that is, uh, a lot of people who imagine the Rodney that has become very popular actually hadn't really read his stuff. I mean, I know more people who've said they've read How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, and they really haven't read it. Mm. Tr trust me, we live in a world where people read 140 characters, but they're not gonna read a whole book. Um, and that's ironic, because 
when you read how Europe underdeveloped Africa, you could see him working through the critique or his assessment of the Russian Revolution. I mean, he talks about the command economy in how Europe underdeveloped Africa. He talks, I mean, he, he, it's a long history about the, the ravages of capitalism and, and, the, and underdevelopment theory, but ultimately, the vision of the future is one that's based on what he's been working on here. So I think that what we have to do is when we go back and actually read and reassess and then go back to Shanti's point, which is when you actually follow Rodney's political path, um, there's a way that even the narrative of the Rodney riots becomes a story about Rodney's identification with Rastafari, and, with, and, and that's it. That's it, there's nothing else. Rodney was identified with the working class with, in, in black power in that context of 1968. It's not black power in today's Afro-pessimist world. It's a very different kind of black power. It's a black proletarian power. It's black power contesting um, uh, uh, Michael Manley. You know, ironically, it's a black power because he goes, so he's in Montreal and and at the same time, 68, then 69, of course, the African Studies Association splits. And much of that is about having a kind of you know, working class, Marxist-Leninist position uh, that's not simply about um, uh, a kind of, I shouldn't say non-ideological, but, but non-Marxist or anti-Marxist or anti-communist position within black power. So I think, um, I, I think that, the, that Walter Rodney developed over time but there's more consistency to his position than we realize. And I think that's the issue. And that's why I, we made it a point to emphasize that the Russian Revolution book was first on the dock. It was first. He didn't evolve to it. He was already in it. And you're absolutely right. When he came to the Un National University in, in Guyana, the point was to teach a course on the Russian Revolution. What I didn't mention either was that there's another set of lectures in different type face that were really meant for the, for the Guyanese. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know what happened. He was appointed chair of that history department. The state said no. They rescinded the, the appointment and waged war on him and his family. And that's ultimately what happened. And of course, he was killed. But I think there's more consistency than we realize. And if, we, if anything comes out of this, even if anything comes out of this, let's be inspired to go back and, and read all of Rodney's work and his oeuvre as anti-imperialist. And if we do that, as, as Vijay says, I think we're gonna have a new Rodney to contend with, and possibly a new movement. Uh, yeah, it's a, that's a great answer. I mean, I, I'm not gonna take much time. I, I think what I, why I think this is an important project is I think this is part of a broader project to reclaim Marxism, in a way, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, this is, now you might say that's a silly thing. I mean, after all, Marxism is largely, you know, reclaim it from whom? I mean, is it really alive and so on? Well, you'll be surprised. I mean, you know, it needs reclaiming. Um, you know, when we think of the living soul of Marxism, we have to inject Marxism with that life, not this sort of death way in which it's engaged. And I would hope that the kind of vitality of Rodney's project is part of that. You know, it's a vital project. The last book, if I'm not wrong, that was published of his was The History of the Guyanese Working Class, yeah, which is exactly about the complexity of plantation society in Guyana and how imperialists utilized different national origins, you know, whether it's from West Africa or from India or whatever, to pit people against each other in different parts of the production process, et cetera. It's a brilliant book, you know. Right. What I would like is, of course, I don't expect everybody to read all of Rodney. I don't expect that. But I would hope that serious intellectuals will read this material and write about it. You know, that's how we bridge these gaps and how we claim legacies for a different project. I mean, after all, we're not playing a nostalgic game. You know, I'm not interested in reclaiming Rodney for the sake of the past. This is a fight for the future, and it's a future of what kind of Marxism we need today to confront you know, global imperialism. And the kind of Marxism we need today is a vital Marxism. It's a Marxism that you can learn from somebody like Walter Rodney, who, again, looked at the concrete conditions in Guyana, 
went back into history not to write a history book, you know, merely for citation, for impact factors, but he needed to write that book to understand how to build the Working People's Alliance. Because the theory for the Working People's Alliance, Rodney's last political party, the theory for that alliance was in his history book. I mean, in fact, the history of the Guyanese working class is the kind of programmatic text for the WPA. You know, and because of that, of course, he's killed. Because Burnham and others couldn't tolerate the fact that Rodney was actually going to succeed in a project that Jagan, for instance, had also tried. I mean, Jagan tried the project of creating working class alliance in uh, Guyana. That was an alliance where Burnham was his ally, by the way, in an earlier time. So what I'm just saying is that it's up to us, actually, to read these books and make the claim for people. You know, not just Rodney, Sankara, other people. We need to bring them back in order to also suggest that, you know, places like Africa, not a country, places like Africa have their own theorists. Mm -hmm. And they have their own theorists of revolution. You know, not merely their theorists of poverty, but they have their revolutionary theorists. You don't need to inject the continent with theory from outside. Now, there's nothing wrong with injecting a place with theory from outside. I have no problem with that. Not a nationalist of that narrow sort. Mm. But at least first read its own theorists and understand what they're trying to say about global transformation. After all, Robin is correct. It's not that one does African studies to study Africans. One studies the world from an African perspective. And here, from the perspective of a pan-African Marxist. That's how Rodney studied the world. And I, I think it would be productive to look at that perspective and see if it helps you understand how you want to be involved in transforming the world. I think it's we have time for one more, question. one more question, one or two more questions, yeah. One in the front row, that's, it's got to be a good question. Though. Hey, it might not be that good, but whatever. <laughs> Just joking. Um, so, uh, Robin, you, you mentioned um, internationalism and it not having the same cachet. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, especially, uh, so I, I organize in the Bronx, I'm like one of, I don't even know many black Marxists left. I'm looking for y'all, um, match.com, whatever. But um, <laughs> um, my, my question is, um, do you think that this book uh, can contribute to bringing back the language of internationalism and uh, third world solidarity, or even solidarity, because that one's like on the chopping block you know, um, do you think that this is a text that can, say, hypothetically be thrown into a reading group with some Afro-pessimists and there be some bridges, maybe, or a light, a small light to move forward? Because that's a project that's actually underway here in the city, nice. trying to read together and find that. So um, I'm hoping that this might be something. What do you guys think? Right. That's such an, that's an excellent, excellent and important critical question. Um, because I want to I wanna be real honest here in terms of what I think the book does and then what we also need to do. Because everything that you laid out is what we need to do. Uh, we need to think, because solidarity is on the chopping block. I've had so many debates uh, where I've had people who were really good on so many things would say things like, you know, well, solidarity is kind of passe. Um, or is that solidarity is a form of commodity exchange. They don't use those terms, but when they say, you know, I won't give you my solidarity unless I get something back, that's not solidarity. That's, that's, market, that's market relations, mm. you know? And so it's, it is true, and, and even the idea that even, and we've been co-opted by a kind of neoliberal language of empathy that somehow uh, in order to build solidarity, you do so by having to sort of identify with the suffering of other people as opposed to seeing the strength in power and recognizing that you actually learn from the people you build with. You don't simply look at them, observe them, and then act accordingly because you have some kind of empathetic feeling. You build because you're trying to win. And you're trying to win because you have a vision of the future that you're trying to, 
bring it to being. Now, to be honest about this book, um, everyone should get this book, no question about it. But the truth is, um, Rodney did have a particular project in mind, and that project was to, to really study uh, the way people understood the Russian Revolution in mid-century. And so a lot of it is these historians and people, uh, Adam Ulam and, and you know, uh, people like uh, Trevor Roper and, and all, these people whose work you will never read. And he's engaging them. It's a very beautifully put together analysis and it's very useful. But it's the kind of thing where if you're trying to build, I wouldn't use this book to build a movement, I would use portions of it maybe. And then there's some things that are missing. And I want to give you, uh, just point out something that's really missing that I point out in the introduction. Um, he doesn't really say almost, he almost says nothing about the Communist International, mm -hmm. which is ironic because, of course, the Communist International was the space where the Third World found its footing even before it was called the Third World. The Communist International was a place where the, 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 the Soviets and others pooled resources to build movements elsewhere in the world, including this, the people that, that Christine is talking about in her book on you know, class struggle and the color line. Um, but he doesn't talk, he, does, he doesn't address it. You would think, why? Well, it makes perfect sense because his interest is in the dynamics of a revolution. What are the internal dynamics of state power? He's trying to really understand what does it mean to build a revolution because he's in a state where they're trying to make a revolution. And he's in a state where they're trying to govern according to socialist principles. And he's thinking about Guyana. And he's thinking about going back home. And what does that mean? Um, that's not to say that he's not interested in the Communist International. He's, he's not to say he's not even knowledgeable about it. His teacher, C.L.R. James, his teacher, in, interlocutor, I should say, um, you know, wrote the first English language book on the Communist International. And it doesn't really come up in the book. And to be fair, Rodney never finished the book. He never finished it. He was killed before I had a chance to finish it. We finished it, and it's unfinished. So we don't know where he would have gone. However, the implications of the book can be the beginning of a conversation. And those implications are, we need to study revolutions. We need to study revolutions in history. We need to re study revolutions in time, in, in, in place and condition. We need to think about the revolutions that we've kind of almost forgotten about it. We need to talk about Thomas and Carr. We need to talk about Grenada. We need to talk about what didn't happen in South Africa. We need to look around the world and pay attention um, in, in a way that takes us out of our comfort zone. Um, and then recognize that when we do that, we now have a solid basis for thinking about what does it mean to build a revolution for our people and know that that revolution is not one that has boundaries or borders. You know, we think differently even about the state. Um, and those are important conversations to have. But that's uh, my thought. But. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is a public service announcement. Uh, I would recommend you uh, please go and visit our website, thetricontinental.org, because one of the tasks that we have uh, for ourselves is to produce material um, for militants and uh, strugglers. Uh, to participate knowledgeably in the battle of ideas. So there's a lot of free downloadable material you can get there, and we've brought, I think, 25 copies of some of our working papers here. You can take, everything is from us is free, by the way. Uh, not free, it's provided socially. Uh, <laughs> it's different, free is a wrong word. It's socially provided. Uh, and why I'm saying that is that you know, one of the important projects we have, I think, is for people who are, have the time and energy to read certain kinds of books and then take the knowledge and wisdom of those books to the people. So, you know, when Rodney, for instance, would go and talk in Jamaica at these public gatherings or in Guyana when he'd give mass uh, speeches, he had prepared for those speeches by reading hundreds of books, thousands of books over the course of his lifetime. You know, the role of an intellectual is not to scoff at scholarly work. The role of the intellectual, in my opinion, is to take scholarly work produced by thousands of years of wisdom, digest it, and interact with working class people, and see what working class people will find useful about that 
scholarly work and then elaborated for the working class and key classes. So it's your job in that sense to read this book and then not necessarily ask everybody to read it, but distill the lessons in a different form. Perhaps write a pamphlet based on Rodney's Russian Revolution. You know, it's our job as people with certain kinds of skill who are linked, plugged into this tradition of schol scholasticism, who are plugged into that tradition to take this knowledge and information from behind not only the paywall of, you know, JSTOR and so on, but also the paywall of the neoliberal academy, which is denying people information and knowledge. And the paywall of the media, which is denying people a reasonable and sober attitude towards world affairs. So in that sense, I would say, please read things like this. But don't read it and then walk around the streets and say, everybody, you got to read this book. Because <laughs> that's a populist understanding of knowledge. It's our job to translate these ideas for our movements. Yeah. Buy it, read it, translate it. Okay. On that note, we're done. We're done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm going to have you clap again. But on that note, please uh, join me in thanking these two, not just for a great conversation tonight, but for um, all the work that went into this phenomenal book. Um, thank you both so much. Thank you.